G'day everyone, Dr Nick Fuller from the University of Sydney Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Today's chat is on the physiology of weight loss and why we fail on our long-term weight loss journey. So stay tuned on the Physical Performance Show. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Earshot's Magnetic Bluetooth Headphones. The headphones of choice for riders and runners who charge. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. And of course, we do this across a range of our different episodes, interest editions, coaches' corners, catch episodes, featured performers, and of course, the ever popular expert edition. And hot off the back of return guest Brad Bevan OAM on last week's Coach's Corner, you are in for a real treat on this week's expert edition featuring Dr. Nick Fuller on all things the physiology of weight loss. Now, this is a crucial conversation. It is not just a conversation that matters to people looking to lose weight, but it's also crucial for the driven athlete, particularly in endurance sports or power weight-based sports who is conscious of their body weight. It's also relevant for practitioners and, of course, coaches and athletes of any level. And get ready for a bucket load of learnings and to have your paradigm shifted as mine was around weight loss. You see, Dr. Nick Fuller will attest today that anytime caloric restriction is involved in an attempt to lose weight, that it is not the answer and that in fact it is doing more harm than good. Now, this isn't just some woo-woo theory. This is hard-based science. By way of bio, Dr. Nick Fuller is the research program lead at the University of Sydney, where he consults at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Dr. Nick Fuller is the founder of the Interval Weight Loss Method, the author of three books from Penguin Publishing, Interval Weight Loss, Interval Weight Loss for Life, and Interval Weight Loss for Women. Dr. Nick holds a Doctorate of Philosophy in Obesity Treatment, a Bachelor's Degree in Human Movement, a Master's Degree in Nutrition and Dietetics. In addition, Dr. Nick has published in top-ranked journals in the medical field, including JAMA, Lancet, International Journal of Obesity, Diabetes, Obesity and Metabolism, and the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Dr. Nick has 69 peer-reviewed publications to his name, and his work has resulted in policy change in the field of obesity and metabolic disease. Quite simply, Dr. Nick is prolific, and I am sure, like myself, your eyes will be opened, metaphorically that is, to the realities of what is happening to us physiologically when we calorically restrict with an attempt to lose weight. You see, by dieting, we are making it worse for ourselves in the long term. So here is Dr. Nick Fuller on all things the physiology of weight loss on this expert edition. Get ready for the learnings. Dr. Nicholas Fuller, welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thanks, Brad. It's uh, it's great to be on the show, a guest on the show, and, and, and love what you do. So thank you. Feelings mutual, Nick, since I've become aware of your body of work, one word sort of jumps to mind, and that's prolific. Uh, as per your bio, you've authored three books with Penguin Publishing all around this concept of interval weight loss. Interval weight loss, the first publication, interval weight loss for life, and then interval weight loss for women, which you said just a moment ago off air is also for men, plus all of your scientific publications and your academic role there at Sydney University. How do you fit it all in? I guess a large part of my work is we have a hospital facility at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, University of Sydney, which is where I work. 
a marvellous building called Charles Perkins. It basically is Australia's largest weight management service. We see the largest volume of patients every year and we're helping them on their weight loss journey. Uh, so that's one thing to see and treat patients, uh, as you know, but it's another then for us to take that science and research from a clinical academic setting to the general public because we need to be able to translate those findings beyond scientific publications and beyond that individual care that we provide here just you know, I guess at a small level in Sydney, Australia. So a large part of what I do is also translating that. And I started that journey uh, a few years ago with this interval weight loss program because the first point of call for everyone that needs to lose weight should be lifestyle intervention. Um, it's not going down that route of, of drugs or um, surgery. It's, it's lifestyle intervention. And we now have um, a lot of good research to show how people can actually succeed long term because as we'll get into, look, there's no doubt that most people can succeed short term with their weight loss goals. But when you talk to them down the track and follow them up in a clinical academic setting, they've put the weight back on and sadly they're in a worse off state, not only physically from the weight they've regained, but also the psychological ramifications that come with that yo-yo dieting and um, increased weight that they're seeing through through this weight cycling. Nick, your unique mix of skill set, the academic world of which you know, 69 peer-reviewed publications have your name on them, uh, plus the implementation of that into the real world, seeing patients, and now, as you say, this translating this knowledge for hopefully the, the better good uh, and the bigger good to reach a bigger audience is just so, so meaningful because is there a single topic on earth that's more misunderstood, fadicized, if that's a word, not fadicized, but fad, F-A-D-icized. There, it is just every year the public is getting bombarded with some new whiz-bang way to lose weight for those that, you know, it's, it's, um, that are needing to. You're spot on. I mean, this industry is saturated <laughs> with misleading, conflicting information, and this is what frustrates us as healthcare professionals. Um, you know, we've got patients coming in here and we are seeing the ramifications of what they've been through for not only years but decades, buying into this dieting industry, following these four, eight, 12-week online weight loss programs that are largely put out by big-name celebrities, social media influencers, and sadly, um, it is doing more harm than good because when it comes down to it, obesity is a science. Our body is... Um, as you well and truly appreciate, is a, a marvellous machine and it is so good at eliminating stress. And in this instance, a stress um, that you're imposing on the body is weight loss. And that is usually, usually achieved through caloric restriction or dieting. Now, um, again, as we'll, we'll tackle, and my, my real passion is preventing what the body usually does, and that's fighting the weight loss um, it, it's we're not failing due to a lack of willpower. Most people can, you know, stick to a lot of these diets. Look, in the instances where they're only doing it for a short period of time and going back to their old way, sure, they're regaining the weight because old habits are coming back in. But even in the instance where they're following programs that are easiest, easier to sustain and more evidence-based um, because they're not telling you to cut out certain foods or food groups, you're going to have your body fighting itself. And this is the, the largest part um, of education that's missing in the general public. And this is what people need to understand, why you're actually failing. It's due to your biology, it's due to your physiology, um, and something that is outside of your control. And it's left over from our time as hunter-gatherers, and we really have our ancestors to think or thank for this. It's, it's frustrating, and our body's very good at protecting against weight loss and not so good at protecting against weight gain. Our body is very good at protecting against weight loss, but not so good at protecting against against weight gain. Can we explore that, Nick? So we're terming this the physiology of weight loss. Most people think, right, I need to lose weight. I'm going to calorie restrict, as you just referred to, not eat as much, maybe increase the output levels, exercise levels, maybe not. But calorie restriction is normally people's immediate thought on how they're going to achieve this, athletes included, of all levels. Can you take us through the physiology of what's happening with weight loss and why it is that the body fights this caloric restriction approach that we all sort of go to? Absolutely. And it's, it's especially relevant for athletes because, look, a lot of us are trying to make weight for different sports 
athletes long term end up having a real struggle on their hands when it comes to managing their weight because of that weight cycling that they're going through. So this is really relevant to everyone that's mm-hmm. trying to to manage their weight long term. Now, when you start a weight loss program, unfortunately, what we've found through our science when we actually research what happens within a person's body when they come to our hospital clinics, the body shuts down. Now, this is what we're talking about with respect to our physiology. What's taking place within our body when you impose that caloric restriction, as you just mentioned, or increase your energy output through more exercise. What happens is your body that's very clever eliminates that stress by, in essence, shutting down. Now, I'm going to give you a very good example, being uh, contestants that appeared on a a public, uh, sorry, popular uh, TV show called The Biggest Loser. Everyone's very familiar with it. It's, It's been prominent in many countries. Luckily, we don't see it anymore because it was doing more harm than good. A very clever scientist actually had um, the vision to say, okay, what we're going to do is measure their metabolism before they go on the show, which they did. The me- metabolism for each of the contestants was about 2,600 calories per day. So that's how much energy they're burning uh, when they're sitting down at rest and how quickly their engine is burning along or how quickly that car might be revving along if it's if potting along the road. Now, what happened was they lost weight. They lost yeah, a huge amount of weight, sure. They measured the metabolism after they lost the weight. It went down to 19 100 calories per day. So not only has their metabolism dropped, um, which we would expect because their body mass has decreased, you don't need as much uh, energy to, to, to burn the amount of weight you have. But what was confronting is that it dropped by a further 15% that us scientists and clinicians can't account for. So not only is your body dropping, the speed of that engine is, is slowing down, but it's dropping by a further 15%. So they measured that at 1,900 calories. Then they followed them up six years later, back on. But sadly, the metabolisms hadn't gone back to the start point. The metabolism has started, had gone down even further. So not only are they were in a worse off position physically because of the weight regain that came from that dieting attempt, but their metabolisms and their, and their engine is now no longer revving along as it used to. So it's going to make it harder for them longer term to keep that weight off. Now, this is just one of the biological protections or physiological responses that takes place when you lose weight. So you've signed up, you've imposed the caloric restriction, doing more exercise, starting to lose weight. What happens is your metabolism goes down, but it goes down by a further 15% because that is your body doing all it can to shut down burn less calories at rest, and ensure you go back to your start point. Now, you might be asking why. Mm. Well, if you think back tens of thousands of years ago, during our time, again, as hunter-gatherers, our ancestors would go long periods of time without food. Food wasn't available on every corner of every block. What would happen was you would learn to shut down. Your body learned to shut down when it wasn't available. When it was available, you would then gorge on these high fat, high sugar foods, naturally found in the environment. But then you would go hours, sometimes even longer, without food, so your body would shut down, hold on to its fat stores. So basically you've got this time um, left over or this this period left over from our time as hunter-gatherers. You put that into the modern-day environment and we have a hard time saying no to all these favourite foods on every corner of every block. Sure, our weight's going up. We respond by dieting. But when we diet, remember, our body shuts down. So this is just one of them. I mean, metabolism is a really good example. Most of us understand metabolism, which is really how many calories you're burning at rest. But another really good one is is, um, appetite hormones. So ghrelin, when you um, haven't eaten for a long period of time, the hunger pangs you experience, well, that's ghrelin levels going up from your stomach, acting on your brain, telling you to go and reach for food. So your stomach's grumbling away and telling you to go and eat food. Now, when you lose weight, ghrelin levels actually go up. So we take blood samples from patients and we see ghrelin levels going up, telling them to go and eat more food to, again, stack that weight back on. And the same thing, after they've stacked the weight back on, ghrelin levels don't go back to normal. They remain elevated so that people continue to eat more food. And, again, that's our body preparing for that next bout of starvation. It's doing all it can to add on a little bit of extra weight, a little bit of extra fat, so that next time you go on diet, it's in a little bit of, uh, I guess, a better state 
a better condition um, to manage that stress uh, going forward. So, look, there are so many of these well-researched pathways now and physiological responses take place. I've written about them in, in um, my books, Interval Weight Loss for Women is a good resource to look at. It explains it in layman's terms. But when people are talking about their thyroid function being sluggish, you know, their adrenal glands pumping out more cortisol, slow or sl um, sluggish metabolism, well, yes, this is left over from your time of dieting. Every time you diet, you're shutting down your body's physiology, you're making it harder for yourself to lose weight on the next attempt. But secondly, you're also driving up your weight. You're driving up your set point. So, look, every year we're putting on 0.5 to 1 kilo because of that addiction to all these foods, processed foods. We're not moving. We're not getting good sleep. But in conjunction to that, we're reacting to the weight problem by dieting. And what does that do? It only accelerates the weight gain. It accelerates the problem. There, there is so much there. I guess the thought may be for some, some people processing well, isn't it just hopeless? Aren't we just doomed to always go back to this set point that you reference uh, whenever someone attempts to try and lose weight through caloric restriction? As you said, there's that down regulation of the, the, the basal metabolic rate. The body's trying to get back to its normal operating point, the set point. So does not, that not paint a bleak picture for those that are looking to lose weight? Well, definitely. I mean, for, for decades now, we've been doing the same thing, right? And we're continually losing weight. We've got this fixation with weight loss. We're doing it up to five times a year, often following the same diets. They're often validated through short-term results. Uh, I follow whatever it might be. X diet uh, gives me that quick instant gratification on the scales. I mean, the popular ones at the moment, are ketos and your intermittent fast. But again, when you follow these people up, you do see their metabolism shutting down. You do see their function being suppressed. You do see their appetite hormones changing, telling them to eat more. And what happens? They've put the weight back on. So when someone's talking to you about their weight loss success, sure, we're not arguing that. People do succeed short term. But when you follow them up months, maybe years, but within that, definitely within that five year window, window usually within two years, they've put the weight back on and they're a little bit heavier than before they started. And that's because of what we just described, that physiological response that's taking place, the eight well-researched pathways that basically mean you're doomed for failure. Well, thanks for sharing, Nick. This has been terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's sad, but I guess, I mean, for a long time, the dieting industry, right, and it doesn't matter, again, like we were saying, you can be trying to make weight for sport. Yeah. We're, we're doing all we can to restrict our food, increase our energy output, and we do succeed. We achieve that short-term goal. But what you're doing, sadly, is making it worse for yourself longer term. Now, luckily, what we do is we're always trialling and testing new approaches. Um, and my largest interest in, is in overcoming our body's usual response to weight loss. We want to be able to shut these pathways off. If we can shut these pathways off, not only do you lose weight short term, but you also lose it long term. And then importantly, you're keeping it off. So our interest is not on Pauline down the road that lost 10 kilos on keto and, you know, a few months later has put it back on. We're only interested in people achieving long-term goals and we typically talk about that in terms of where they're at five years down the track. Five years plus and, and let's explore this. Nick, can I just loop back just for a moment yes. to a comment you made before we explore the, these strategies for long-term, five years plus successful weight loss? You mentioned that every year we're gaining 0.5 to 1 kilo. Is that just in general terms as a population or it, because of modern conveniences with, with food choices or is that just uh, an ageing related, an age related change? Yeah, this is a good question. So before the 1970s, um, we didn't really have a weight problem. Most of us were, were in a normal healthy weight range. Very clever part of our brain called the hypothalamus um, tells us when and when we shouldn't eat. And, you know, we didn't have these processed and packaged and fast foods on every corner of every block. We didn't rely on motor vehicles to get everywhere from A to B. We weren't addicted to devices up all night looking at them. So we got good sleep. Around the 70s, 80s, that crude time point, not only do you start to see the evolution of the modern day environment and process and packaged foods becoming more readily available, but also motor vehicles, technology starting to boom. Um, now, that is why we start to see this increase in our waste 
and our weight, okay? We, we are addicted to these processed and packaged foods. They make us feel good. We go back for more. And our body cannot cope with, I guess, the ingestion of these foods every day, day in, day out. And then, in, I guess, parallel to that, as, as mentioned, we're not moving like we used to. We evolved to move. Nowadays, we're barely getting any incidental activity and then we're up all night looking at phones, keeping, they keep us awake, we get poor sleep, which also has a flow and effect with our lifestyle choices. So we're answering your question, that 0.5 to 1 kilo is the baseline weight gain that we see. Okay. But worse still, you remember you, you sort of see that 0.5 to 1 kilo over the course of 5, 10 years. What do you do? You look in the mirror, you don't feel good. You hear about, well, there's that societal peer pressure from, from others um, so that you do something about your weight, particularly women. They're targeted through the dieting industry, so you sign up to a diet. Mm. You lose the weight, but remember your body shuts down, fights the weight loss. You go back to your start point, but you put on a little bit extra. So not only do you put the 0.5 to 1 kilo on every year, you end up putting the 1.5 to 2 kilos on every year. You accelerate the weight gain problem that you've got. Mm. So you would have been better off doing nothing. And we have some great research around twins looking at this, um, which basically shows the twin that diet is, diets over their lifetime always ends up heavier than the one that hadn't. Nick, uh, two questions spring to mind before we explore these successful long-term weight loss strategies. Yes. And, of co- and we also want to, sh- want to explore this theme of how athletes manage energy availability and don't fall into the red S trap or relative energy deficiency trap. The first question, you mentioned sleep. I think most people appreciate that sleep's an important health aspect. It's, there's been a great growing awareness of sleep's benefits in society in, in modern times. But can you link that to what effect a lack of sleep has on the body's physiology around weight loss and, and certain hormones? Yeah, I mean, look, what it does result in is, is um, an increase in cortisol production from the adrenal glands. And we do know that that's the result of that is long-term weight gain. But the other thing that's going on is when you have poor sleep, believe it or not, it does result in poorer lifestyle choices because we think it's easier to go to the vending machine, mm. to go to the corner shop. Yeah. We don't prioritise food preparation or um, we're, we're fatigued so we don't get outdoors and move. Um, and it has this flow on effect. So poor sleep ends up resulting yes, in, yes, hormonal changes, as you just um, as you mentioned, but second to that, and, and really the primary cause is that we think it's easier to just skip that daily exercise, to go to the vending machine, to skip the, the food prep, and we end up just having a, an abundance of these energy-dense, low-nutritious um, foods, not move, and over time, your waist gives, your waistline goes up. And I think we can all relate to when we are more tired for whatever reason, young children, phones, Netflix, binging, whatever it may be, the next day nothing's as easy. And, and I certainly can attest to the fact that I'll reach for those sweet things, you know, more often than not just as a, a little pick-me-up. So uh, I think we can all relate to that. And then, Nick, you may have already mentioned, I know you have mentioned this, but I guess the burning question would be, why is it that the body wants to always go back to this set point? Uh, you mentioned there's the scientists and practitioners can't account for that down regulation of resting metabolic rate in response to caloric restriction. But why is there such a strong drive to return to it? Why can't the body just adapt at the new weight and stay there? Yeah, and we wish we wish it would because it would make this obesity epidemic so much easier to manage. But um, there's a couple of things going on. Our genes have not changed over time. We always talk about genes, but when you look at our ancestors, we have the same genes. What has happened is we've seen a change in environment. The modern-day environment, remember, is saturated with all the, the processed and packaged foods on every corner of every block. They weren't available during our time as hunter-gatherers. Food was not in abundance like it was now. So you put our ancestors' genes which haven't changed over time in the modern day environment where food is everywhere, you can't say no, Hmm. you've got this evolutionary mismatch. So consequently, you're putting all this food in and your weight's going up over time. So you might ask why. We also touched on, remember, we would go long periods of time without Hmm. food. It wasn't available. So what would happen was when we'd forage for that food, it became available, we, we, we seek out that food, 
we would then binge and gorge on these naturally, on these nature's foods, high in sugar, high in fat, store it. Our body would then shut down when food wasn't available. It would hold on to its fat stores until food was available again. And that was in order to procreate and survive. Otherwise, our weight would have just been going down and fluctuating enormously over time. And that wouldn't have allowed the evolution of a human population. So really what you've got is the ancestors' genes in the modern day environment, which are wired for a completely different, I guess, environment. Because remember, food wasn't available. It's now available. We've got this evolutionary mismatch, which, which results in our weight steadily going up over time. And then we react by dieting. Body shuts down to eliminate that stress to take us back to our start point. So this is a strong drive to get back to the start point. So how do people successfully navigate this body's response? Nick, what are some of these long-term successful approaches? And obviously this is some of the foundational work of this interval weight loss you know, type approach that you've coined there. Remember what we're doing, the primary goal is switching off the physiological responses, the, the, the biological protections that kick in the gear. We now know that if you lose weight in cycles, so four-week cycles, you can do that. So quite simply, that looks like, you know, I, I come and see you, Brad, and you say, okay, you've got to lose weight in, in four-week cycles over time. So I'm allowed to go out and lose a couple of kilos over the course of a month, which is approximately 0.5 kilo weight loss per week, very easy to achieve for most people. But then the next month, you tell me I have to maintain my weight. I'm not allowed to keep going on and losing weight. And I say, hang on, but the number's going down. I'm really excited. Everything's going in the right way. But you tell me you have to maintain your weight for the second month to switch off your body's physique. Then you go through that month and then I'm allowed to go on and lose another couple of kilos. Then you say, hang on, Nick, you've got to switch off, take the foot off the accelerator and maintain your weight again. I maintain my weight for the fourth month from the month before. So two kilos, maintain, two kilos, which equates to four, maintain, two kilos, six kilos, maintain. And you follow that, which enables, until you reach your goal weight, which enables a person to achieve approximately a 12 kilo weight loss over the course of a year. Now, this is the hardest thing for a person to comprehend because we want the results now. Mm. And we as healthcare professionals telling people and patients that you have to maintain your weight every second month from the month before, well, we don't want to do that because, again, we want that result now. We've got to get ready for that event mm. or that summer body that we want to have. So it's a very challenging concept for a person to get their head around. But when they've been on this dieting industry for years and most mostly decades, people understand that this is needed in order to switch off their body's biology and physiology. So it's about losing weight in full week cycles, on, off, on, off. It's like a step-down period approach. And remember these maintenance months, every second month, are saying to your body, you can have a rest, you can allow your body to redefine its set point at this no, new lowered set weight before then going on to lose weight. So it doesn't result in the metabolism going down, it doesn't result in your appetite hormones changing, telling you to eat more. It doesn't result in your thyroid function being suppressed. Your adrenal glands aren't pumping out more cortisol. So this is good. This is what we want. This is the primary goal of what we're trying to achieve with this interval weight loss approach. And we know that people following this approach, importantly, then keep the weight off. I mean, it's not the word that you'd use, I'm sure, but in simple terms, it's almost like tricking the body that this is our new modus operandi this weight on those four week maintenance blocks but my question would be nick and i'm sure listeners listening in is there something magical about the four weeks why is it not five or six is it just like a man-made construct or human-made construct or is it um is there something more meaningful about the four week interval yeah sure so there's i guess a few different pieces to that puzzle um we do trial and test different methods uh, two weeks on, two weeks off. But when it comes down to it, what we're finding is people adhere to the month on, month off best. It's yeah. so easy usually for people to achieve that 0.5 over the course of a week. The other question, you know, a lot of people might have is why two kilos? Because if you go beyond that, if you start hitting that sort of three kilo or 5% weight loss, this is when your body starts to go into shutdown mode. Remember, we want to lose a small amount of weight prevent the shutdown, 
go into the maintenance month, allow it to readjust, then you can go on and lose again. So it's only a couple of kilos because we want to prevent the body kicking into the fight or flight response. Mm. And secondly, because it's very manageable for a person to lose that 0.5 per week, which allows approximately two kilos over the course of a month. Now, look, it's not picture perfect. Some months you might lose three, another month you might lose one. The maintenance months are all about keeping your weight within a, a kilo of the weight loss month before. Um, and you monitor and monitor and track your weight over time, once per week, same time, same day. And luckily through the university last year, we did translate this into an online version too, so people can actually be accountable online because you don't need to see healthcare professionals to succeed on the plan. A large part of this, remember, is just getting the education to the population so that they are empowered with that information so they can regain control of health and weight and stop dieting. Yeah, I mean, the, the practitioners, whether it's digital or on an online platform or in person, we're only ever the guide anyway. It's, yes. you know, as you say, if we can impart that education, it's no different to me rehabilitating a tendinopathy or helping to rehabilitate a tendinopathy. It takes time, sometimes a year. And if you can educate people, see the lights go on, mm-hmm. then there's going to be normally a successful outcome. But if there's that passive reliance, it's, it's almost doomed. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess that's another thing with healthcare professionals, um, not just physios, but but all healthcare professionals, usually an underlying cause it can be weight. Mm-hmm. Okay, So if that person has a few extra kilos, it is something you need to be able to, to um, treat as well because that helps with the long-term prognosis of that patient, retention, yep. and um, your client management So and patient management. So that doesn't mean you need to be able to treat weight. But you need to be able to sort of bring it up, maybe in this fun and the biggest loser example, the metabolism, how our body shuts down. Yep. Um, could be referring to the podcast, saying, you know, heard this great podcast and explaining that science and then allowing them to sort of go on and, and, and follow evidence-based care. You're listening to Dr. Nick Fuller, Research Program Lead at the University of Sydney and the founder of Interval Weight Loss on this expert edition exploring all things the physiology of weight loss and why we are failing on our weight loss attempts long term. Support for today's show comes from the great folk and incredible product at Earshots Headphones. Earshots is a disruptive action sport headphone company dedicated to unlocking human potential through sound. They are the headphones of choice for athletes who charge. Co-founder and CEO James Bell Booth became frustrated by the constant distraction of his headphones dislodging and falling out. And off the back of that, Earshot's Bluetooth headphone technologies were birthed. The headphones are first of their kind with proprietary magnetic ear clip design. This unique design ensures it can withstand the sharp shocks, speed and functional movements of action sports, unlocking new freedom of movement without compromising on sound. And perhaps my favourite feature of Earshot's headphones is the fact that they have 20 hours of charge. No more running out of charge three or four hours into a session. Now the great folk at Earshot's headphones have generously offered up 10% off a set of Earshot's headphones normally retailing at $169 by simply using the coupon code TPPS or capitals at the checkout. And if that's not a compelling enough offer to get your ears into a better state when you train, then go into the draw to win one pair of Earshots headphones each month for the next three months by jumping over to the Physical Performance Show's show notes page for this episode and there you can enter your details to be in the draw. Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio's online telehealth consultations. If you are an endurance athlete struggling with a bone, tendon or joint related concern, then our online 45 minute telehealth consultations can help you get back to your physical best. Our online consultations have been used by endurance athletes world over with great success. So be sure to jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth to schedule your online 45 minute consultation with myself or any of the Pogo Physio team. And if you'd like feedback or advice around your ongoing niggle or concern, you're also welcome to drop me an email, b.beer, at pogophysio.com.au. And finally, support for today's show also comes from our very own Learnings membership. It's very simple. From just $5 per month, you can support production of the show over at Patreon. Just search The Physical Performance Show, and in return, we'll grant you complimentary access to our normally 
$49 per person ticketed live stream events scheduled for 2021. Moreover, we'll also grant you access to our back catalogue of live stream events featuring Dr. Shona Halson on all things recovery essentials for optimal performance and Dr. Stephen Siler, forefather of polarised training, with his very popular 2020 live stream, Sustainable Training for Attainable Endurance Goals. And a massive thanks to this week's new patron, Alistair Russell. Alistair, thank you for your contribution to the show. For now, let's jump back with this week's expert edition featuring Dr. Nick Fuller, research program lead at the University of Sydney and the founder of Interval Weight Loss. On this expert edition exploring all things the physiology of weight loss and why we are failing on our weight loss journeys long term. Two questions, Nick, just off the back of what you shared. How do people monitor their weight? We hear about the evils of scales. And the second question would be, how do people know how far to go? Where's their stop-off point? How do people identify what's appropriate and what's too much with weight loss? Yeah, and go, again, good question. So the first one with respect to weighing yourself, I mean, I've seen patients that were weighing themselves, sadly, anywhere between 12 and 20 times a day. They were jumping on the scales and it was this fixation that everything they put into their body they believed was changing fat mass. So we know that's not the case. I mean, it's about helping a person move away from the scales because all of those daily fluctuations um, are largely related to hydration and meal consumption. They don't mean anything. So what we do with our online interval weight loss program is just get a person to weigh themselves same time same day you can do this at home as long as you've got a good reliable set of scales and you monitor that trend over time now it's of course um, very hard to do for many people and it might mean you need to wean down the amount of times you're weighing yourself but you've got to work towards just once a week because we're only interested in the trend those day-to-day fluctuations mean absolutely nothing. Um, We also know that that is all you need to be doing for long-term success. Once a week is perfect. Um, It's it's plentiful and you don't need to be doing any more than that. Sure, you might start with a couple of times a week as you're working um, out how your body reacts to the plan, but over time you've got to work to the one day per week. And you've got to be accountable. You've got to monitor that visually um, so you can see that trend over time. Remember, it's not going to be picture perfect. It might be not a straight two kilos down, flat. It's going to look a bit squiggly, especially to start with, but over time it's going to be going in the right direction. And the other thing I'll say with that is a lot of people struggle initially because they've been restricting all these different foods and food groups and then told that they are healthy, you're allowed to have them. They reintroduce them. They see an increase in the scales, but what they're seeing is an increase in body water content. It's not a change in fat mass. What you're doing often with the first few months on the interval weight loss plan is unwinding all the damage you've done through dieting. You've got to allow your body's metabolism to restore your appetite wiring system um, to come back to its equilibrium, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the other question was relating to the the plan and and how far. And how far. So the actual concept is based on six uh, key steps, which does make it, easy to follow and allows anyone to follow it. So instead of telling you how many calories to eat, how many grams of food to weigh out and what obscure ingredients to look for, um, you're simply eating from big to small throughout the day um, and including whole grain, carbohydrate, protein and fat at every meal, which is also important for athletes to make sure it's nutritionally balanced. But we also know that's important for our health and long-term weight management. Um, And then in terms of the sleep and, and activity, well, obviously, Incidental plays a very important role. Sometimes we're overtraining. We need to reassess what we're doing, mix up what we're doing, introduce new environments, new training stimulus, because that's often what is needed to lose that small amount of weight loss you're looking for. And then with regards to sleep health, it's disrupting your evening routine, doing something different, turning off the technology, getting away from devices and allowing yourself an hour or two before bed every night for your brain to allow or understand that it's nighttime instead of daytime because remember these devices do emit blue light, suppress melatonin production, which makes it hard to get to sleep and also stay asleep. Mm -hmm. Now, tying that into how to know, uh, I guess, how far to go, remember you're monitoring your weight once per week. So 
if I'm kicking off and I'm, I'm starting to notice and I'm losing 0.8 kilos per week, well, you're losing a bit too much and you're probably going to go worse over the course of the month. So you need to ease off. You might need to introduce more food. You might need to introduce more of those good fats, cook with more olive oils, more avocado, or you might need to switch off on your training intensity, reduce the volume, um, maybe focus on a, a little bit less. So it really depends on the individual, but those six principles allow a person to work out what might be out of whack so that you do try and hit that rough two kilos per week and you do that by monitoring weight once per week, same time, same day. But remember, it's not picture perfect as long as, as, it, as, long as that's, um, it's approximately two kilos. You don't want to go beyond the three because, remember, all you're going to start seeing is your body switching uh, and shutting down. And Nick, the reference to not counting calories, uh, mm. just to not over overlook that, I, that's something that I see often with highly detail-oriented, driven type A athletes is yes. high performers. It's, they're aware of all this, but and then obviously there's context, everyone's individual circumstances, but is that generally something that you steer people or recommend they don't do is, is count? They just have education around what you said, eating big to small? Yeah, eating big to small. I mean, this is a, a, another very important point you raise. If you think about it and, and when you look at the science, when you're getting a person, well, in the modern environment, most of the time we're eating and relying on the process and fast foods. We're not getting a lot of these nature's treats, the, the low-calorie, nutrient-dense foods, um, which is what we should be putting into the body most of the time. So when you look at the research studies and you get a person to switch from largely processed to unprocessed foods, by default, you do see a caloric restriction of about 500 calories per day anyway. Mm. So it sort of achieves that goal. Um, and then the second thing is we've got it the complete wrong way around in the Monday environment. We wake up, we rush out the door and we typically grab a coffee, we fast in the morning, and then we start to increase our food consumption at lunch through the afternoon and dinner ends up being the, the largest meal of the day. We also know this is not good for weight management because our body is better at burning that fuel in the morning, okay? So when you sit down people to identical meals, they actually burn the energy from that meal much more efficiently at breakfast compared to the evening meal. It doesn't matter about the time of the day, it just means that you should be focusing on breakfast as your biggest meal. It might mean you have two to three breakfasts, smaller breakfasts, lunch, and then dinner is your smallest meal. It's the most important from a social and cultural perspective. And if you're training in the evening, it might mean you have, you know, a couple of smaller meals, but working towards that big to small funnel throughout the day. Nick, uh, before we explore, and I put you under pressure, uh, under stress, <laughs> the top three mistakes and the top three tips, can we just explore the, the athletic world uh, in terms of one of the big emergent topics of conversation is this idea of relative energy, relative energy deficiency in sport uh, with implications being health uh, and performance decrements. It's something that working in that space a lot, I see time and time again, it's arguably one of the key drivers in every bone stress injury presentation that ever presents for a physiotherapy. There's obviously this fixation and understandable because weight does affect performance in body weight centric sports, running, cycling, you, you name it. So people appreciate that we've had scientists share before, Trent Stellingworth springs to mind around periodizing body composition for athletes around important meets or events of the year trying to get lean. But what advice would you give to athletes around managing weight? And, you know, we hear that it's okay to put on a few kilos in the off season, but we do all know of athletes who have come out of highly successful athletic careers that in inverted comment quotas here, word at this out, what are they called, Nick? Uh, inverted commas. Inverted commas, yeah. <laughs> Nick, we all know of athletes in inverted commas who blow out post their careers. So I guess just what tips would you share for the athletic world around not falling into energy deficiency, not blowing out post their career and periodizing body? It's a, it's a, it's a big Big one there. I haven't helped you with a very specific question. It is, and there's a lot of information to tackle there. But I guess the most important thing is that restriction and deprivation can do more harm than good. Okay. okay? Now, not only in terms of injuries and injury setbacks, um, but 
from training. Nutrition plays such an important role. We've sort of been led to believe that deprivation and restriction is the answer, mm. and it couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. In most instances, athletes especially need to increase their food intake, and they need to be looking at the entire, I guess, daily plan and making sure that they're encompassing all the food groups and all nutrients. Another key one that's often missing is, is dairy. We think that dairy causes weight gain, but it's a rich source of calcium. It may not be from cow's um, products. It could also be from, from suitable um, non-dairy sources. But this is where that, I guess, assessment needs to be made. So restriction and deprivation is not the answer. Your body's just going to shut down, okay? It's going to learn to adjust for that deprivation, and it's not going to help you with your weight management. It's going to make it worse. But then secondly, without that proper nutrition, because of the restriction and food avoidance, you're going to probably end up having more injuries and you're not going to recover from your training as efficiently. I guess the same information applies to everyone. It still yeah. applies to, to athletes. We, we need to be able to digest this information. Remember, the interval weight loss plan is telling you what to eat. It is telling you what science shows you we should be putting into our body, not only for health, but also long-term weight management and in this instance, it might be preventing in injury and recovering um, adequately and efficiently. So you really need to be, uh, I guess, adopting an, an open mindset and blocking out a lot of this noise because a lot of that information we are disseminated every day of every week um, is coming from unqualified, uncredentialed personnel, and it is often doing more harm than good. You need to be encompassing all food groups, all foods, and often it means increasing your food intake. So many times we've seen it where people just boost their energy intake, of course, from nature's treats, more of the whole grain breads and cereals, the lean protein sources, good sources of fat. Not only does it help them with their weight management goals, but it also helps them with their athletic performance because we also have um, a large research institute looking at athletes. Yeah, brilliant. I've written down there, restriction and deprivation can do more harm than good. And it's not my space clin clinically or as a professional, but the general term I often throw out to the patients coming back from a bone stress injury is just eat more than you think you need. Now, that is very unscientific, um, but it's maybe just switching on a thought process that helps them start to maybe move in the right direction. But just to, sum, uh, to, to clarify, Nick, is there a potential, I suspect there is from that, that statement, downside to athletes dropping body weight, say, once a year for a big event or competition, but then putting it back on on the other side of that event. Does that have a negative effect long term? Well, can Absolutely, it? definitely. So this is, again, another form of weight cycling. It's, it's mm. um, uh, I guess, like yo-yo dieting. Remember, every time you're going through restriction, deprivation, it's a stress on the body. It reacts by putting that weight back on. So you will end up going back to your set point or that weight you remember being at for a long period of time at some point. So you might lose it for the event yep. um, or for the season, but yes, it will climb back. And as you're doing this, all you're doing is driving up your set point. And athletes post-career, some of the, I guess, one of the population groups that have the biggest struggle when it comes to weight management, yeah. they're the ones that are seeing their weight just, mm. you know, largely out of control. It's very sad and it's due to a lot of that weight cycling. And that makes sense. I mean, I, I grew up in the 90s and one of my cycling heroes, Jan Ulrich, German Olympic champion, Tour de France champion, and you'd see him every year go from sort of a pot belly on the bike to puffy cheeks to getting lean through the, the grand tours and then it would just go on again every year. And it was the, the commentators, Phil Liggett would talk about that. Yeah. Um, and it was just accepted. That's normal and maybe that's just what happens. But we now know more. You're sharing more. Uh, yeah, we do know more. And and, and, and they do suffer long-term. I mean, yeah. you look at them, follow them post-career, they are struggling with their weight. And not only that, their health. Mm. And it's not just physical, yeah. it's mental health re repercussions. Gosh. Oh, Nick, this has uh, been a, a very, very fascinating conversation thus far. I'm going to pop you under the pump here, Nick, and okay. get you to, uh, <laughs> in some of this you've shared already, but what would you say are the top three mistakes in general terms, people make around weight loss. Listening to celebrities and following social media sensations, just because they are a TV celebrity or, a, you know, an influencer that has millions of people following them, the science of obesity. Remember, this should be thought of 
um, just much like cancer. It's a, it's a reoccurring, relapsing disease process. It's not easy to lose weight, and that is because you have your body fighting itself. So you've got to stop listening to these people. You've got to block out this noise, equip yourself with um, evidence-based care, and if you do that, you won't have to worry about your weight long term. So that's the first and most important message. Great. Two, top, second top mistake. Oh, I mean, this is probably tying into that restriction. I mean, this is such an important and vital point to make. People always just think that if I restrict and I cut out certain food groups, it's the answer to my weight. And remember, yes, it's going to be the answer to your weight short term, but it's going to make it harder for you longer term. It's going to make it harder next season and the year after. And then eventually your performance is going to decrease anyway. Mm. So, and not only that, not only during the time of training and and elite performance um, or trying to manage the weight at that time, if you're overweight or have obesity, but longer term, all you're doing is driving up your set point the weight that you remember being at for a long period of time, it's making the situation for you worse. So restriction yep. is not the answer. Number three, top third top mistake. Third top mistake. Well, this relates to uh, training. Now, much like an athlete, if you give them the same training program day in, day out, what happens? Their performance plateaus. Mm. So same for someone that's trying to lose weight. They've got to shake up what they're doing. They've got to change their evening routine. They've got to get away from the TV, do different Mm -hmm. things, engage in constructive activities. When it comes to training, they've got to mix up what they do. They've got to try higher intensity training. It might be on a bike or a rowing machine in the comfort of their own home, non-body weight bearing, but it's got to be different and it needs to be potentially different environments, different stimulus. So change what you're doing. Think of yourself as an athlete at all times if you change that training, it'll help you ch- achieve that small amount of weight loss you're looking for during the weight loss months. And then during the maintenance months, you can ease off on the intensity and volume, allow your body the rest it needs, and importantly, maintain that weight from the, the month before. You're listening to Dr. Nick Fuller on this expert edition, research program lead at the University of Sydney and the founder of Interval Weight Loss, sharing around all things the physiology of weight loss and why we are failing on our weight loss journeys long term. Now, if you missed last week's episode, it's been very popular. It was a Coach's Corner episode featuring return guest of the show, having prior featured on episode 15, Brad Bevan, OAM, head coach of the M5 Triathlon Academies program. Now, Brad shared some great practical tips to help you improve your endurance, sporting performance and game. Here's a little snippet of my conversation with, incidentally, my childhood hero, Brad Bevan. I've had a large um, shift in the way I, I coach with having a lot more rest. And I see the guys still making the mistake now, but, you know, it's hard when you're, you're starting out not to think more is better or harder is better, that you just got to keep pushing harder and harder. You've got to, almost my job, especially with the M5 guys, is on the handbrake. I've got to pull them back. Be sure to jump back and enjoy the full set of learnings from Brad Bevan's sharings whilst they peruse the archives dating right back to episode one featuring surf life-saving Ironman champion, Ali Day. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured guest, Dr. Nick Fuller, on all things the physiology of weight loss. Brought to you by Earshot's Magnetic Headphones. Every guest of the show issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week, and then we're going to also come to our set question around top tip, uh, single tip. So what's Dr. Nick Fuller's physical challenge going to be to listeners? It's eating big to small, okay? Eating big to small. Everyone's going to give this a go. Most of us will say, I don't feel hungry in the morning. I I skip breakfast um, and volume increases throughout the day. day." Now, remember, this is not going to change overnight. Um, It does take a couple of months for that appetite wiring system to recognise that breakfast is needed and that you are hungry in the morning. So start gradual. Start putting something in the morning, slowly build it up over time, but you need to focus on tapering off throughout the day. Eating big to small, and it's it's very catchy that statement. Easy to remember, portable. Yes, yeah, very. And it, look, it is easy to follow too. Remember, I'm not telling you to count calories, weigh out grams of food. 
eat big for small. And a rough guide um, for men and women is, is three fists at breakfast, two at lunch, one at dinner. And this doesn't include salad, salad and vegetables. They're unlimited and you can still have your morning and afternoon teas. But remember, it's big to small throughout the day. Gosh, that's very practical too. Three fists in the morning, two fists yep. at lunch, if I heard correctly, and one fist in the evening. Exactly, exactly. And remember, you can still load up that plate with lots of salad, lots of vegetables. Your morning and afternoon teas will, might include um, plenty of dairy, nuts and seeds, fruits as well. And, I'm, you know, I'm going to make an open open uh, clenched fist there. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Nick, uh, every guest of the show, as you know, uh, gets pushed to issue one solitary piece of advice to help listeners of this show perform at their own physical best. So what is Dr. Nick Fuller's single piece of advice going to be? Stop dieting. Stop doing it. It's, it's, it hasn't worked for decades. We have to stop doing what we have always been doing. Um, this industry is, need, is in need of disruption, okay? You, you need to equip yourself with that right evidence-based information because, remember, dieting is largely doing more harm than good because it's driving up your set point over time. Stop dieting. Uh, wow. And uh, <laughs> could there be a more counterintuitive message <laughs> for, you know, societal society's norms? And, we've, you know, we've, we've looked at it through the lens of performance and obviously health, uh, but just to share and to round out the conversation, uh, Nick, how big of a problem is this, as you reference, obesity epidemic? Like we all know it's happening, but mm. maybe some facts and figures and, and what will happen if we don't start to improve things? What may yeah, happen? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's, it is a bit doom and gloom. In Australia, two in three people are clinically diagnosed as overweight. So when you walk around at lunchtime or whatever it might be, you walk, look at the people and observe them. Two in three of those people will have a little bit of extra weight around the waistline, around the, the buttocks, and basically meaning that um, they're putting themselves at increased risk of other diseases like type 2 diabetes, heart disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease at some point down the track. And remember, weight only gets worse with time, which then means that person moves into an obesity range, et cetera, et cetera. So two in three people and about one in three children, and this is only getting worse too. So we're passing it on to the next generation we need to be able to instill good habits in the family environment mm. and educate our children and, and, and um, the next generation on what a healthy lifestyle looks like. This is not about talking um, with them about weight. This is just about role modelling and instilling good habits with food, activity and sleep. It rubs off on them and it will help them long term with their weight as well and health. Yeah, gosh, two in three uh, adults and one in three children. Uh, and obesity is referenced in terms of body mass index, BMI, mm. or is that is that the scientific approach? It is. As you know, it's a very crude measure, not relevant for athletes. I mean, especially when we're carrying a higher muscle mass, I can put you in an overweight range. Mm. That's why for athletes, use a waist measure um, and... 94 centimetres for men, less than that, and less than 80 centimetres for um, women. But, look, yes, that, that BMI height um, is height and weight, which are the, the measures used to, to calculate it, is what we use in a hospital clinical setting. Yeah. Dr Nick Fuller, your work is so important and, thankfully, it's not done with yet. Uh, I will myself be picking up a copy of Interval Weight Loss, uh, your first book, and then obviously there's the following two, Interval Weight Loss for Life and Interval Weight Loss for Women. So they'd, they'd be available obviously at any good publishing house or online. Penguin is your publisher. Uh, where else can people engage with you and your materials? Yeah, a lot of this information, you know, you can digest um, in so many different ways. Jump online, there's the intervalweightloss.com website, which is basically the online program, mobile web app, which allows you to follow the program and be accountable online. There's a community group you can be involved with um, and share your journey along the way too. Remember, there's going to be people just starting and there's going to be people many years down the track that have not only achieved their goal weight, but um, it will help you, yeah, maintain it and will help you on your journey. So there's that. There's also um, the informational website, intervalweightloss.com.au, where you can go and watch informational videos 
um, understand the six principles, download some educational materials because you can follow it in so many different ways. If you're a big reader, I'd recommend just go to your library, borrow the book, start with Interval Weight Loss for Women. It's also suitable for men, as you mentioned. Mm. Read the information, read it again, and you've got to unlearn what you've learnt in the past because that is often the hardest thing. So, yes, you can digest it in many different ways. Um, and if you really want that extra accountability, of course, you can be doing that online um, with that online mobile web app. Brilliant. Dr. Nick, thank you for your contribution to the Physical Performance Show and the, the greater good. And uh, certainly wish you all the best for the rest of the year and all these upcoming projects uh, and the dissemination of the science. Thank you, Brad. Very kind. Um, honestly, great to be on your show. Keep up the great work. And I hope this has also helped, you know, not only listeners, but healthcare professionals educate their patients with their weight management journey. Yeah, a large proportion of the listenership of the show, Nick, are health professionals. That's so right. uh, that it's just such a such a meaningful medium to, to get good science out. So thank you once again. Thanks, Brad. I uh, look forward to keeping in touch. So there you have it, another episode of The Physical Performance Show. And I trust and I know you enjoyed today's episode featuring Dr. Nick Fuller. Well, what an eye-opener that conversation was. It certainly changed my approach and understanding of all things weight loss. And remember, this is not just a conversation pertaining to the individuals deemed obese or those looking to purposefully lose weight. It also has very shrewd consequences and implications for endurance athletes who, as Dr. Nick Fuller outlined, so often get caught up in the weight cycling game, losing weight before an event, putting it back on, etc. And we've all seen athletes long-term who do go on to have trouble in their latter years post-professional sport. So be sure to pick up a copy of Interval Weight Loss. I've done so already, and I highly recommend the book, whether you are a coach, athlete, or practitioner. It's simple. Just Google Interval Weight Loss. You can also check out the online programs or jump over to drnickfuller.com. So Dr. Nick Fuller, once again, thank you for your outstanding contribution. Thank yous must also go to this week's show sponsor, Earshot's Bluetooth Headphone Technologies. If you are looking for a robust, bulletproof set of headphones that won't fall out and that won't go flat, look no further than Earshot's headphones. Remember, you can get 10% off this excellent product, normally retailing at $169 Australian dollars, simply by using the coupon code TPPS at checkout. And be sure to also go into the draw to win one pair of Earshots headphones being given away every month for the next three months by jumping over to pogophysio.com.au and heading over to the show notes where you can enter your details. Don't forget if you are an endurance athlete struggling with bone, tendon or joint related concerns, help can be a simple telehealth session away. You can schedule your telehealth consultation 45 minutes in length with myself or any of the Pogo Physio team by jumping over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth. And lastly, if you'd like to support the production of the show, then don't forget the Patreon Learnings membership from just $5 per month, of which in return will grant you access to all upcoming live stream events and all of our back catalogued live stream events. Massive thanks to the great folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration, and Matthew Olding on all things show graphic design. A huge thank you to those who have left a rating and review over on iTunes. If you have enjoyed several episodes of the Physical Performance Show and would be so kind to leave a rating and review over on iTunes, that would help immensely. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, we jump across the ditch to our friends in New Zealand and we'll share with you a conversation with featured performer Dougal Allen. Now, incidentally, Dougal is a long-term listener of the Physical Performance Show, but Dougal's success in the multi-sport world is absolutely outstanding. Dougal is the coast-to-coast world multi-sport champion and the course record holder for Challenge Wanaka. His list of international and regional victories is extensive and illustrates both consistency and high performance. And off the back of Dougal's own athletic success, he's channeled that into his head coach role at DA Endurance. So be sure to enjoy the learnings on next week's episode. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show. 